Harold Davis. I'm here to teach you about the art and craft of digital photography. Harold Davis is a best-selling author of many books, including his latest, Creative Garden Photography from Rocky Nook, which can now be pre-ordered. He's the developer of a unique technique for photographing flowers for transparency, a Moab master, and a Zeiss ambassador. He's an internationally known photographer and a sought-after workshop leader. His website is digitalfieldguide.com. Now, I'm going to hand it over to Harold. Harold, are you there? I think I'm here. Uh, I think I see you. Hi, everyone. It's nice to be here. Uh, there's a pretty big list of topics where I'm going to do my best to cover today. And this is kind of like a, uh, a salad bar or a smorgasbord. You're not going to use all of them on every image. But, you'll, but these are good things to have in one's quiver. Um, the, uh, we... we we want to handle everything that I'm showing today with both as a recipe and as a thought experiment so that you understand where you're going with your image. There are many possibilities and it really depends what you want to do. Not all images are created equally, not all approaches to images are equally, and, not, and with a particular image, you may want to go a different place with it. So I'm going to show you a bunch of different techniques. For me, the single most surprising one is the one I call painting in the petals, and I'll show at least a couple of examples of that. Let me start by uh, running through a quick recap of where we've been so far. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay, photographing flowers for transparency, uh, post-production topics. Here's the uh, agenda table of contents. The review and recap, we're doing that right now. Retouching, it's the rare image in any genre that doesn't need some retouching. In the old days, when you made a print, and I used to make my own color prints in the dark room with chemistry and all that. Uh, almost every image needed some spotting, okay? And what you do is you take out a watercolor brush and uh, a set of water-based color retouch colors and you would try like heck not to ruin the expensive uh, print as you do it. These days, uh, the tools are the spot healing brush and the clone tool. Um, but we'll, I'll run through a bit of that because most images need some of it. And the funny thing about retouching a small spot on an image is in the greater world, you don't even really see that the spots are there. <laughs> I mean, compared to the size of, a, of an image coming out of a modern digital camera, the spots and the gremlins there are very, very small. But, but that said, it hits people at an unconscious level. If you leave the spots in, they know they're there somehow. Painting in the petals, well, um, I think I started at the way beginning of this presentation saying that a pixel doesn't know who its mama is. Pixel does not know who its mama is. I hope I know who my mama is, but then again, you never know. But anyhow, uh, the point really is that you can emphasize translucency by adding colors on your own. And the eye doesn't know whether those colors are added above or below in terms of layers. Photoshop blending modes give you a tremendous number of uh, techniques and tools. Painting in white, we touched on the last session. Uh, the object here is basically to get rid of the grays and blurs that are in the white. But what a technique that's a surprise is that you can add a white layer to add translucency using a layer mask. And I'll show you how to do that. Um, since we're talking about the gray blurs, I thought the next logical topic was how to use the L channel and lab to remove gray from an image. Uh, I do want to say that 
LAB itself, lab, is a big topic. We have the webinar recording up from the first session in LAB. If you want to get more deeper into the techniques, you might want to go review that because answers to a lot of questions about it will be in that webinar. Also, we're running the second webinar in that session Saturday, I think. I think that's right, Phyllis, isn't it? And so that's a possibility too, to go review the first webinar and then sign up for the second one. So I'm going to look at the two for effect, inverting black and for white with a flower image. That again, that has to be just an overview because there's a lot in LAB. I'll also take a look at how I use filter effects. For example, Topaz Glow, Topaz Impression. There are many others. They're, what, they're nice filter effects from On One. The, uh, the Nick set of filters in uh, Color FX has some great ones. We're gonna also look at how you use textures and backgrounds. A thought experiment until we get there is um, to think about what the difference between a texture and a background is. They're two very different things. And then we'll talk a little about uh, what you should be doing before the fifth one of these webinars. We've scheduled it, um, a couple of weeks out at least. I don't remember the uh, exact date, but that should give you time to do plenty of your own work. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? Everybody, practice, practice, practice. So I wouldn't be doing the light box images that I do if I didn't practice it a lot, and you should practice it a lot too. Um, so you have a few weeks to do it, and the best news here is if you run into trouble or you have preliminary versions and want suggestions, you know where you can tag them on Instagram or send the image to me and we'll see what we can do to help you before the next session. Okay, with that said, here, here's the uh, two cent version of exposing a light box image. Create a white background, seven to 10 exposures, to start completely overexposed, or if you prefer, completely underexposed. Manual exposure, bracket shutter speeds, one EV increments. Stop when you get to the dark side or the light side, if you're going the other way around. Uh, reserve an HDR blend. Here's a set of exposures for a dahlia that on the top row, the second from the left uh, is at four seconds to the last one, that midpoint, uh, HLD8186 is a 30th of a second. That's the exposure range. Here's an underexposure histogram. Here's an overexposure one. All we care about is the white quadrant of the exposure histogram curve. And here's what it looks like when, when the image is done. Here's the brightest exposure, the four second exposure. Here's the 30, 1 30th of a second exposure. By the way, once again, this is the uh, setting that your camera will tell you is the right exposure with a strongly backlit image. It makes the side of the image facing the camera close to black or at least very dark. So just remember, you are smarter than your camera. Okay, before we move on to processing, Phyllis, any questions about ex the exposure review? I'm gonna take a sip of water while, while you consider that. Um, no questions so far. I'll keep my eye on the chat. Thank you. Thank you for all you do, Phyllis. Oh, thank you, Harold. Start with the most overexposed layer. Use the same Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw settings on each. Add darker images with layer, layering, layer masks, and the brush tool. Consider adding the reserved HDR blend at the top of the stack to add punch. Here's a stack. We worked through, I think, two examples by now of how to do this. So if you need a refresher, please go back and look at the recordings on YouTube. And I think these are just a few examples thrown in here. Bunch of filters listed. And I'll, I'll come back to the slide uh, at the end of the presentation where to submit your work.
Rita wants to know what type of file is the HDR used on the top of the stack? The it's either a TIFF or a PSD, Rita. The nor, normally the software will give you a choice of whether you want to save it as a TIFF or a or a, or a PSD, and it really doesn't make a whole lot of difference. I I tend to save mine as PSD, the native Photoshop format, but that's it's pretty much can be either of those two formats. And yes, Sabine and Deborah are right. It's not Tuesday, May 21st. It's Thursday, May 21st. Good grief. Thank you, uh, Sabine and Deborah. <laughs> I somehow cannot type the word Thursday. I'm always typing Tuesday. I don't know why. Well, we started out on Tuesday, and maybe we're stuck in a time warp here in our sheltering in place, and everything is just repeating <laughs> over and over again. Okay, this one I think is as good an example as any to start with. Um, okay, what have we got here? So I reduced the size of this image. Um, let's see. Here's a final version of the thing. is coming up on the wrong screen. There you go. Yeah. I just want to give you a good look at it. This is the way the image ended up. Okay. Um, so flowers from our gardens of various sorts. The most prominent ones there are popover poppies uh, with some other little accent flowers. Okay. That's where we're going. Um, Here are the here are the raw files that I started with. What I've done here to make life easier for all of us is to chop them down in terms of the bit depth and um, and and save them as PSDs already so that we don't have to go through the uh, process of converting all of them for the sake of understanding what comes next. Okay, so this is uh, a 40th of a second exposure. Uh, all exposures are using the 55 millimeter Zeiss Otis lens on a tripod on a light box. Um, with this particular light box, by the way, it's got a generally uh, yellowish Cast. It's coming out of fluorescent daylight balance tubes. So I set my white balance manually to about 6200K Kelvin, which, you know, is a more than you maybe wanted to know, but there you have it. The um, f-stop on all of these is f16, which is as far as this lens stops down. And the ISO is 64, and so all the exposures are the same. I didn't do anything else. Here's a 20th of a second. Here's a 10th of a second. Here's a quarter of a second. Half a second. One second. Two seconds. four seconds. When we get there, here is the uh, L channel inversion of the image. Here's a final, a JPEG of the final version of the image. And last but not least, let's open up this file. This is a um, Okay, so here you have my first blend. 
Let me roll through what the layer stack looks like. I'm taking off the visibility as we speak of all the layers, okay? So here's the first layer that's 9147. Just to go back to bridge for a second, that first layer is, is this one. It's the four second exposure. And it, you know, I'm gonna go up the ladder the same, the same way. So 9147, four second exposure. Next, you move to a two second exposure. If I turned off this layer mask, if I disable the layer mask, you don't see a whole lot of difference. I was painting this in at pretty complete opacity. Okay. Oh, Harold, there's some questions when you get to it. This would be as a water sip is as good a time as any. Go for it. Okay, Seta is asking, I get a bluish tint on the light box. What exposure should I use? Well, there, there's no simple answer to that question, um, I'm afraid, because look, what you, you say what ex, you asked what exposure should I use? But if you look at the stack we have here, we have seven or eight different exposures, right? So what you should do is a blend of exposures. Part of the point of um, doing the blend of exposures is exactly to get rid of that cast. As, as you get darker in the exposure, whatever the light cast the light is throwing out is gonna become more pronounced visually. So let, let, for example, if I went up to my uh, 9142 here, with, um, I uh, see what I can do to get this mouse a little more responsive. It looks like that. So that's a pretty yellowish cast. And that's because the image is uh, on the underexposed side. 9142 over here is the 40th of a second exposure, right? So, so what you want to do is you want to do, you want to, um, you want to use the exposure range that, that you make with you, with using this technique to answer the question that you're getting too blue or in the case of the image I showed you to yellow a cast. What you can also do is something that I mentioned as a sort of an aside right at the beginning of this presentation. If you have a light box that for whatever reason has a particularly strong color cast, like the one I shot this image on has this yellowish, um, overly warm color cast, what, and it sounds like Seta's cast is a blue cast, you can actually go and use your camera to tell you what the, a white balance of the light source is. You do that by taking a photo at roughly the right exposure according to the camera of the image and examining it in Lightroom or Photoshop and it will tell you what the as shot Kelvin white balance of the image is. You can then dial that in manually to get a neutral look out of the image. There's a manual white balance setting on most cameras. So this in and of itself is a substantial and long topic for discussion. And if there's a great deal of interest in it, I'm gonna be happy to take it up further next time. So, so keep that in mind when you phrase questions you might like to see me answer next time. Uh, Joe asks, what's the brand of lens? It's a Zeiss, uh, it's, it's a Zeiss, it's a wonderful lens. A Zeiss Otis 55 millimeter f1.4. It's my favorite lens for doing this kind of work, not a macro lens. And Christine wants to know, can you show us just the layer mask as well for each layer as you go through this? I will show some, some of them about as that is a compromise. Here's <laughs> this one. <laughs> and David says, what's the criteria you use? you use to hide or show flowers at each layer? Yes, uh, I mean, it's a great question, but hard one to answer. You guys are throwing good questions at me today. Uh, 
I mean, it, it, some of it is the business about getting to Carnegie Hall, practice, practice, practice. After a while, you get a feeling for it. But remember that I said before, uh, these stacks are like a, uh, like a wedding cake. The lower down in the wedding cake you are, the more you show and the stronger you, you show it. The higher up you go, the less you want to show. Fundamentally, this is partly about maintaining the illusion of translucency. So high up, if you paint it all in, you're going, you're going to get something that's very untranslucent indeed, very solid looking. So, you know, even, even a cursory glance at the layer masks through here, if you look at my layer stack, shows that uh, what, what I've done is that the further down in the stack you go, the longer the exposure, the more of it goes into the image. By the time you get up to this layer mask here, you can see it's just a few accent points, nothing else. Uh, who asked that question? Joe, was it? Right. Uh, Joe, uh, it, please follow up if this doesn't quite help you or if you do get it. I want to understand if I've really answered your question. Uh huh. No, actually, I think it was David. David. Right. And okay. um, would you use a gray card to get white balance set correctly? I probably would not use a gray card, although that's advisable. An 18% gray card is advisable for obtaining a neutral color reference in many situations because the logistics of it are appallingly difficult. You said so the gray card is designed for reflective light, light falling upon it. The light box is a backlit source. So what you'd have to do to make that work is set up a situation where the gray card is mounted very uh, like a foot away from the light box source. And what you're doing is you're running the camera as photo spectrometer off the gray card. It's almost inconceivable to me that that would really work well. All right, I think that's the questions for now. And gosh, you're keeping me on my toes, people. I like it. <laughs> Okay, so here's the next layer. Let me disable the layer mask. Okay, so you're, you're beginning when you look at it, you're beginning to get the outlines of what this final image is going to look like. You can see its bones pretty well. And by the time you get to this point, you're going to want to be careful to not overpaint the dark stuff. I mean, for example, the uh, stalks, the stems, whatever the right word is for the poppies are about where they ought to be. Let me re-enable the light box, the layer, and let me show you that layer, okay? <laughs> one thing that's interesting about this one, I mean, it's kind of like a brain with a spine going into it in shape. You can see how strongly I painted in the uh, stems on this layer. Honestly, I think what happened was they were too, uh, not not strong enough when I had originally done this. So I came back and painted them in very strongly. And one reason for that is if you look at the stems close up, and I'm going to do this right now, if you look at the stems close up of these uh, of these wonderful poppies, they've got these little hairs on them, okay? It's, let's see. Well, you can't really see it very well on this knockdown JPEG that I have here, I'm afraid. But they, there, you can see it a little better now. But uh, when you look at the, the, and it is worth saying that I'm showing you a knockdown JPEG of the image, not the full high resolution image. The, when you look at these, they have these beautiful little delicate hairs. And a pitfall with this kind of image is that if you don't take care of these details, it's easy enough to wipe them out of the whole thing. And that would be sad. So that's part of why this this layer mask here shows the uh, stem so well. Okay, so uh, this was four seconds, two seconds, one second, now we're up to half a second. Um, once again, I'm not painting in the full thing, although quite honestly, if you just were to take the half a second exposure, you'd have a pretty nice image. But look over here, it's too dark there. And there are a couple of other places where it's too dark as well. Enable layer mask. I don't know how much you really see from the layer masks, but there, what I've done is I've painted in the outlines of the flower strongly. And you can see right here, 
this area. I, I pointed at it in the image itself. I said, that's too dark. Well, here, obviously, I went back in and said, it's getting too dark, let's, let's paint that out. So you have to review, regard this part of the process as very unmachine-like. You're really looking and seeing what you're getting and painting, and painting it in and doing your best to create a uh, very attractive image based on what's there. Okay. Oopsie daisy, what, what have I done? Uh, what haven't I done? Okay, so four seconds, two seconds, one second, half a second, a quarter of a second. Here's the way the image is turning out. If I didn't have the layer mask, now it's definitely too dark. And what's terribly too dark here are the background areas. You really don't want a background like that, okay? And we're beginning to paint in very relatively little and relatively light, okay? There's the layer mask. All right, this is the top of the, this is the, um, uh, well, let's see, what was it? This is the 140th of a second layer here. Somehow I've lost my mouse. I've lost my mouse, I've lost my mouse, okay. Well, there's some more questions when you have a chance. It's as good a time as any, Phyllis. Go ahead, go for it. Don would like to know, as, are you keeping all the masks on or are you using light and blending mode for all except the top HDR mode? These are all, the, 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 there, 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 are two, there are two questions regarding blending modes. One is, what are you using the tool, for example, mostly the brush tool with? And the other is, what's the blending mode of the overall layer? So far, these are all at, in normal blending mode. The brush is set to normal blending mode and the opacity is at 100%. If I were thinking that I had done something too strongly, I would probably paint it back out using black instead of white on the layer mask. But if I come to it in the end and I say, hey, this layer is too much, then I'm perfectly re it's perfectly reasonable to take down the overall layer opacity. For example, you can go like that and say, I don't want that layer at all. Okay, is, uh, are there other questions here? Uh, no, that's it for now. All right, so here we have the reserved HDR blend. Um, if you look at what that looks like, it looks pretty technical term crappy, uh, particularly the background. However, some parts of it are actually pretty nice. For example, right there, that's actually a pretty nice effect. So the point here would be to keep the good stuff and eschew the rest. Eschew meaning get rid of the rest. Keep the good, get rid of the bad. So if you look at what we've done here, here is the layer mask, okay? I kept basically the centers of the flowers and the poppy stems. So here you have your layer stack. Um, this is the key part of the operation. From here, what the next step is, is to, um, Mer it's archive it. So the first thing I do is I go save as. Now, I, I haven't changed anything here, so I'm just gonna pretend to do a save as, okay? I, I already have this, uh, this saved. And then the next thing you do is you merge the layer down, layer, flatten image, okay? And then I go save as. And let's see, I will call this pass.a, okay? 
because as I indicated, you need some system, whether it's alphabetical or numerical, to keep track of the order you do th these things in. So you can understand what you've done if you want to repeat it, if you want a formula, if you want anything like that. Okay, the next thing I would do with this image is probably crop it the way I'm likely to want it to be. Before I do that though, Note that with that last um, bit of, uh, of, of HDR on top, you can really see those cute little hairs on the, uh, on the poppy stems. And that adds a real touch of realism. I think it's important to understand that a lot of what people respond to in these kinds of images have to do with um, subliminal appeal to things, not just, not just the things that you see. Um, so the next thing I would do here is crop it. And let's get the Photoshop background up so I have my crop tool behind me. Okay. And there, there are arguments to be said for keeping a basic format, such as the original ratio or making it a square. But with an image like this, that's really not possible. You're not gonna wanna do that. So I, what I do is I just pull it in to basically symmetric. I wanna leave the stems as long as I can. I pull it in to roughly similar left and right. Maybe I keep an eye on the top to see what the right height is. Um, I, I, I go check to accept it like that and then I'm going to save it as a new version. So this would be B since we already did A. Okay, so the next item on our list is retouching. And Joe has a question when you have a minute. Go ahead, Joe. Uh, you start the flow from bridge. How about Lightroom? So it's the same difference. This, the engine beneath Adobe Camera Raw and Lightroom are the same. I could have started this in Lightroom perfectly well. And if you go back and review last week's webinar, you'll see that I did show how to do it from Lightroom as well as from Adobe Camera Raw. Uh, the, from the point of view of this kind of process, there's very little difference between the two pieces of software other than the way they look up front. Okay, yep. so one of the things to do here before you start even thinking about retouching is to work on a duplicate layer. You always wanna work on duplicate layers in Photoshop, even if it seems kind of a bit of extra work uh, because it seems silly. Um, the reason that you wanna work on extra layers is because that way you can take it back. If, you, if you've gone some distance, and you don't wanna to have to back up through the history palette or go uh, Command Z constantly. You can just paint it out in the layer. And that, so that's why you do it on a new layer. So I go layer, duplicate layer. And if I, for some reason it's opening up off screen, but I do believe we can, we can deal with that. Okay, and I call the duplicate layer retouch. So now if you can see in the layers panel up here, you have a layer stack. And what I do is I use the magnifier tool to find where there might be what is technically called griblies. So actually there are quite a few, you don't see them out at a distance, but you know, all, all this white stuff over here, this is nature's gribbly. There probably are some coming from the camera as well. All these things are things that <clears throat> are easy to fix, but make a difference under the covers. So the trick with the spot healing brush, which is what I've now just activated, is to 
make it in size a little bigger, but not a lot bigger than what you ought to uh, take care of. Again, this is a knockdown file. So, okay. Well, I'm, I'm just fixing a few of these. Everybody see that? Okay, that makes the nasty griblies go bye-bye quite easily. And let's see if we can find one and use the clone stamp on it. Uh, perhaps. Okay, well actually the uh, spot healer would take care of these too, but let's just clone stamp them. My, my clone stamp and, and stuff is used to working on much bigger areas than we've got here, but you sample it and you go like that. So it's a good idea to have some good music while you do this stuff. You want to be really thorough and get everything. Before I move on, any questions about spot retouching? Uh, I don't see any questions. Nancy wonders, if you flatten an image, can you recover the layers later? Well, it's a great question, Nancy. And essentially the answer is no. The reason for archiving a copy with the layers unflattened is that that way you have them as they were, but the best you can do is go back to that point where you save the unflattened layers. Sadly, once they're merged down, you've lost those pixels. Flattening layers, merging down, is one of the few actions in Photoshop that is actually pixel destructive. So no, you can't just go back to the layers. That's the reason for keeping this careful archive trail with the A, B, C, D, okay? So next, let's look at where the rubber meets the road, the painting and petals part of this whole thing. So I'm going to layer down this image I'm, I, I'm going to save it, okay? So I, I might as well show that. The first thing I should do is, uh, is uh, save it, okay? Then I'm going to layer it down, flatten the image. I do a save as, and I'm going to call this C. So I'm going to duplicate my layer, layer, duplicate layer, and I'm going to call this paint, painting in the petals. I gave it a fancy name because this is something worth remembering. Okay, so let's take this passage up here. I could, could have picked others as well. And you see how there's a bit of the um, flower under here. You can make out the outline. What you want to do is you want to be careful to mimic the actual form of the thing. You don't want to try to invent stuff out of whole cloth. So what I'm going to do as a first step is I'm going to take the eyedropper tool and I'm going to sample the color of this blue flower, okay? So if I look in the foreground color, it's roughly the right color. Now I'm gonna take my brush tool and I'm going to make it a reasonable size for this. Um, I'm gonna make, it, it's still too big. I'm gonna make it Oh, about like that. I'm going to put the opacity down to 30%, and I'm going to go like that. It's okay to exaggerate a little because you can always take the overall opacity of it down if when you back out it doesn't look good. Now I'm going to show you something really naughty. Okay. So what I'm going to do I'm going to take the clone stamp tool. I'm going to put it right over this its companion flower here. I'm going to sample the center of the flower. I'm going to put the opacity that I pasted it with down to say 
20%, and I'm going to line it up pretty well and paste it right there. Okay, everybody see that? See how I just painted in a translucent look on the white flower there? Okay, any questions about that? That's, that's magic. Uh, Anger wants to know, do you ever work on the images as smart objects? Yeah, well, <clears throat> There's no reason not to, Inger, except for systems resources. I find that with, when what I'm doing accumulates layers up to the level that a lot of what I do does, that it just degrades my uh, system performance enough that, that it doesn't make the convenience of being able to go back with the smart object helpful. Certainly something like this manual painting is not going to work very particularly better with a smart object, but if they're helpful to you, uh, go for it basically. Um, Yukiko is wondering if you could just repeat the magic again. Yeah. Let's do it. Uh, let's do another example for it where it's, it's really pretty clear. Um, yeah. Cause I, I, um, give me a sec here. Ah, yes. This was the one where I really wanted to show it. Um, for the sake of argument, I am going to just open this midpoint image here without having put it through um, without having put it through the multiple layer stack business. So in real life, this would look somewhat better than it does um, because because the background would be whiter, the center of the red poppy here would be lighter and so on. But for the sake of this demo, I'm going to ignore all that stuff. So here I put a duplicate layer on. I call it paint. This time I'm briefer. I'm gonna sample using the eyedrop tool. And one thing that I missed mentioning last time is sample size for the eyedrop tool. That's actually important because it could lead you pretty far wrong. You, you have a palette with the drop down list here. You can see it probably on the upper left of your screen that goes from a point sample to a fairly large pixel size, about 100 by 100, and averages it. You want somewhere in the middle there either five by five or 11 by 11. If you, if you go too large, you're not gonna get a clear color. If you um, go too small point sample, you know, you can just, it can just really uh, lead, lead you astray. So I'm going to poke it right here. And you can see in the foreground color, it's red. I'm gonna take my brush tool. I'm gonna put it at about 30% opacity. And I'm going to look at the outline here of my petals, and I'm going to paint them in like that. And then I'm going to do this um, magic thing with the uh, clone stamper too. Now, I don't want to pe get people too carried away with this clone stamping. I mean, it's, well, let's see, we also need to go like that, and maybe, there you go. Okay, let's, uh, let's zoom in on that a little. Zoom, so to speak. Okay, so if, if I were to take that off, there's what I added. Um, Inger and everybody else, any questions about this? Um, so far, everybody's just saying thanks. Okay, let's let me just save this off and go back to our other example. I'm say I don't know why I'm saving it, but uh, force a habit. Force a habit, exactly. Force of habit. Habit is important with this, actually. Oh, Carol wants to know, uh, does the clone stamp preserve the texture and the pattern? Uh, yes. That's why, why, that's why I use it, and that's why it's naughty. 
let's let's carry on with this image and um, and and do it a little bit more just to just to make the point here. Um, uh, where's good? Let's do it a couple more times. I mean, the brush you can use very nicely just to uh, ju just to get color in. But if you also want texture, you need uh, something more than that. Often, I won't bother with the clone stamp part of it, just to be really clear. And you know, like many of the techniques I show, this shouldn't be overdone. You know, a little bit's good, a lot bit can look grotesque sometimes. Okay, so I painted in a little red there, just to have the little red there. Then um, let's let's do this one here. He could he could use a little. So you see there's a blue flower cluster under there. Um, let's sample the blue. Uh, like about here, that's a good sample. Let's paint in a bit. That's way too big a brush. Okay. And let's be real naughty about this and go back and take that nice flower as a as a uh, as a clone sample and put put a little bit in the center there. Okay, I'm sampling right here. Actually, let me we'll move it a little. Yeah. There we go. And you, the, depending on how you have the clone stamp tool, it'll preview what you're doing, which can either drive you crazy or uh, or not, depending. There we go. Okay, I'm gonna save this. Any questions about this at this point? Um, I think everybody's good so far. Actually, um, David had a question about the layer masks. Are they uh, a specific uh, level of gray? Or is it just you know a black layer mask, white layer mask, and you're painting on with uh, different levels of opacity with the uh, brush tool? Yeah, that's correct. Um, so a, a black, black conceals, white reveals when you're referring to the layer associated with a layer mask. And what I've been doing on all the layer masks that we showed in the initial uh, setup here is to use a black hide all layer mask with each layer because it's easier to paint in uh, revelatory stuff that way. Sometimes one will go the other way around. This process of painting in the parts you want on the layer is um, something that I, I think of as uh, like having something come to life in the dark room. So yes, the amount of gray you paint in. If black conceals and white reveals a 50% gray brush, will give will 50% reveal and 50% conceal. So that's exactly right. Um, okay, good, good basic Photoshop stuff at great question. Let me, so I've saved this, I've archived it. I'm gonna layer it down, flatten image and go save as. By the way, I have my own name for merging down. I call it smushing. So we smushed it down, technical term. And what I'm next going to um, work on here is how to use blending modes. Um, there are many blending modes in Photoshop that are useful, but the most useful in this kind of image are the screen blending mode, which lightens, and the multiply blending mode, which darkens. Typically, you want to use these two um, different blending modes in tandem. So if you're going to use one, you want to use the other. Um, so layer, duplicate layer, and let's use the first one to lighten a bit. So I'm going to put it in screen blending mode. Now you can see that it lightened the image considerably. 
Now I'm gonna put a hide all layer mask on. I'm gonna take my brush and I'm gonna paint it in at about 30%. Nice big fat brush, well it's too big for this. You don't want it to be uh, kind of smushy. You wanna, so everyone see what, what that does there? My, my mouse is not the world's most responsive animal this, these day, today, but such is life. So the very effect on parts of this image is to add apparent translucency. Remember the principle of chiaroscuro, which is that you get a sense of depth by contrasting darks and lights. So that's part of the idea behind using both uh, screen blending mode and multiply blending mode. So I'm, to get multiply blending mode here, I'm going to make another background copy. And let me go back and be a nice person and label what I did. And this one up here, I'm going to put into multiply blending mode. And you can see how much darker it made things. layer, layer mask, hide all. And then again, I'm gonna take a brush. In this case, I'm gonna make my brush a little smaller and I'm gonna make my opacity a little higher and I'm gonna just do the centers of the flowers. That's actually a pretty common setup is to make the centers of your flowers darker and the petals lighter, okay? so. When I'm happy with this, here's what we did. We added softness to the petals with screen blending mode and hardness to the center of the flowers with multiply blending mode. I'm gonna save it. And any questions about this before I move on? Yeah, there are a few questions. Um, Don wants to know, do you ever photograph individual flowers simply to use as references for the clone stamp? For example, the violets. There isn't an entire violet exposed, but it might be handy to have one for the violet on the right side to use for the transparency. Don, what a great idea. I'll have to, I'll have to consider it next time. And, Beautiful. Uh, uh, that's one reason I like giving these uh, kinds of webinars because, you know, that didn't occur to me, but you're perfectly right. I mean, I don't have an exposed uh, viola, violet here, and uh, it would be a very nice thing to have. And uh, Sabine wants to know, do you ever use the blending mode on a brush or just the layer? Yes, great, great question. For the most part, I use blending modes in the layer, not the brush, and here's, here's the problem. I'm painting in the mask, not the image. If I were painting in the image, itself, a blending mode in the brush could possibly make sense, but it really doesn't on the mask, okay? All the mask cares about is the amount of grayscale you're painting in. It doesn't really care about the color effects, and mostly blending modes have to do with how, so see, here, here's, here's what a blending mode is technically. Technically speaking, a blending mode is a recipe or formula that describes how a pixel combines with the pixel below it in a layer stack. If you're looking at normal blending mode, the formula is that the top pixel gets 100%. All other blending modes use some other way to combine the color values in the upper pixel with the pixel right beneath it. So that being the case, it, do, it makes no real sense to use a blending mode on a layer mask as opposed to on a layer. But that's a great question, thank you. And Kwang Sik would like to know, can you show us how to avoid gray, the gray background? Well, Kwang Sik, we're getting there. Um, the, the, in life, there is progress, not perfection, alas. And there's no avoiding the gray background, but there is ameliorating it. So being careful about painting in the layer masks as you build up your layer stack helps with this, as I showed last time. 
Um, and you could review the video from last session on that. But if you look at this se a section of this image right here, the, the parts right near the flowers like this have some gray background. So let's first of all layer down our blending and multiply mode, okay? And we'll do a save as. And we're going to call this one E since we're up to E. And we're going to duplicate our layer, layer, duplicate layer. And you can see that I do a lot of layer duplicate layers. Um, every time I don't do that and I get lazy and try to do it right on the background layer itself, I um, live, learn to regret it. So I try not to be too lazy about that. Now what I do is I'm going back to my, uh, my tool pal palette or panel or whatever they call it these days. And I'm making sure that white is my foreground color. I take my brush and I put it at 100% opacity, 100% flow. I make it harder than it was enough so that it has an edge. And I can start painting out any gray areas. Yeah, I have to be careful not to do what I just did, which is paint over the existing subject matter. So this is one of three ways that I'm going to show to deal with the gray blurs, to ameliorate. You'll never be just like um, in running our household with our three teenagers and six people here, Dirty dishes are always with us. Well, gray blurs are always going to be with you. It's positively biblical. No offense to the Bible. That last one wasn't terribly good. So what I would do is I would go back here and get rid of it. Okay, so this is technique number one for ameliorating gray blurs. Paint over it with white. Okay. And there's a, a question that goes along with this. In order to maintain the hairs on the stem, how do you avoid the gray ghosts? Yes, good question. Um, and, I'm, I'm, and I'm getting there. Um, <laughs> again, some uh, gray ghosts on the hairs are gonna be inevitable when you have something like that. If you're gonna paint in that stuff, you're gonna get gray blurs. But the, the technique I'm gonna use to help with that is the third of the techniques that I'm going to show, which is using a curve adjustment in LAB color to uh, to improve the white and non non blur characteristics. You can't have it both ways. I mean, fundamentally, is part of the problem here. So let me save off this E version. Not that I did much to it, but a habit is a habit, and let me show something else layer, flatten image, and I better do a save as. So this is, this is F. And now what I'm gonna do, instead of duplicating my layer, I'm going to add a new layer, okay? And this layer I'm gonna fill in a minute with white. And I would, if I could just go white here, I would, but it won't let me. So I just go like that. Now I, I use the paintbrush tool, <coughs> which re, uh, resides, the paint bucket tool, which resides on the uh, tool panel below the gradient tool. I select it, it looks like a, either a high school diploma cap or a paint bucket. Make sure white's my foreground color, and I fill this with white. Oh, Harold, you made the image disappear. Well, yeah, kind of. So I'm going to put a hide all layer mask onto here. Layer, layer mask, hide all. And now what I have is essentially a far more flexible way to paint in things. If I want to paint in a little bit of white over part of the flowers, I can do that. I put my brush down to maybe 20%. 
and my flow down to 50. Make sure my brush is nice and soft. You don't want it hard for this thing. And I can paint in petal soft goodness. At higher opacities, what I can also do is deal with blurring around edges. For example, I can put it at 100% opacity, 100% flow, and a very like that. Okay. Let's move on going to save this. And now the hairs on the poppy legs are a great example of something where you're simply not going to go in and paint out gray blurs hair by hair. <clears throat> okay. I mean, I don't know, you know, with the right music or something, maybe I'm capable of it, but it, you want some kind of tool to do this for you. So let's, let's uh, go to town here. The, here's a, uh, as I said at the beginning, give me one second, I need a sip of water. Uh, As I said at the beginning of this presentation, LAB is a big subject unto itself. We've got a recording up from last week that shows many of the basics of it. Uh, we're having another LAB session coming up, but, but there basically are some formulas I can give you here. So first thing I do is I move this image into LAB, image mode LAB. You don't want to move a layered document into, into a different color space. So I had to layer it down before I did this, but right here I'm going to add another layer because I want to operate under on, on, a, on a duplicate, not on the original layer. As I've said, you always want to operate on a duplicate layer. Now I use the curve tool, image adjustment curve. Now, a couple of things to note about the curve tool here. The first one is, is that I'm operating only on the lightness channel. In LAB, the lightness channel is um, black and white information and black and white information only. So the gray blurs reside in the lightness channel. <laughs> if you can tame the lightness channel, you have tamed the gray blurs. There are two techniques with this curve that help with the gray blurs. The first and probably most important is to draw the endpoints together. To the extent that you draw the endpoint, particularly the black endpoint in, you are you are helping with the gray blur tool. Okay. Now let me just click OK there. Let's go down and have a look at what just happened on the now that probably was too far. Look took away the gray blur, but it also took away the hair. So if you go 50%, you have a bit of each. You can play with this. Let's, let's go back up. What you can all, and you, the way you adjust that curve tool is crucial in the, for the business of the, um, of the gray blurs. The other point with the curve tool is that you can simply drag over the top like this, particularly in an area where you, which needs special attention. Um, an S-shaped curved is a good thing to aim for. Pull it over like this, and that pretty much solves the uh, gray blur problem in the hairs at the leg of this thing, okay? If you don't like the way a curve application looks overall, but you do like the way it looks in a specific passage or area of an image, that's where you'll use a layer mask. Okay, so at this point, I would save this like this.
I would layer down the image. I would flatten the image. And I would save as. And let's, um, since we are in LAB color right now, let us look at inverting this image. Because one of the things I showed you was, was an inversion um, as, uh, as See, where was that? Right, so let's see how we get there. If I can ever get my mouse back. And when you have a minute, there's some more questions. I'll bet there are. <laughs> I just covered uh, basically a doctorate worth of LAB and uh, like here's a little formula for it. Yeah, sure. Right, Harold. Okay, go ahead. Uh, do you ever use the adjustments panel curves as a separate layer? Uh, that works the same way. That is just as good. I mean, personally, my own, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those guys who grew up with uh, Photoshop version 0 0.5. So I, I tend to use the more uh, old fashioned tools, but an, a, an adjustment curve would work just as well. And I think Kathleen asked, um, um, would you ask Harold to do that again? <laughs> <laughs> can I, uh, can I, yeah, why not? I mean, I was going to say, why don't you watch it on the, on the rerun, but, um, but we, we can do it again. Let's see. Um, and and together with that, Joe asked, did he use any masking on the curves? No masking on the curves, none whatsoever. But, but his comment was that um, he sure could have. Right. If you have an area of the layer that you've used the curves on that you really like, you can add a hide all layer mask and then just paint in that area that you really like. Yeah, Phyllis is exactly right, of course. Um, so... You know, each a curve is a work of art. As one uh, Photoshop friend of mine puts it, you know, he he uh, he used to use all kinds of uh, adjustment tools and to modify images, and decided he could do them all with curves anyhow. But getting the right curve is not necessarily easy. So that was the curve adjustment I applied uh, here. Image adjustment curves, and here's roughly speaking what it was. I brought the black endpoint in. I I brought the black down like this, and I brought the white up more. So that's roughly speaking the curve that I applied. This is the the classic good uh, lightness curve is is a sideways S shape of some kind that tends to be what you should aim for. And you know how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. As you get used to doing curve adjustments, particularly curve adjustments combined with um, layers and detail layer masking, you'll get good at this. It's a it's a form of it's a visual tool for applying corrections to an image and a great visual tool, I might add. Part of the secret of LAB is that it separates out. Um, it separates out um, the lightness, the black and white from the color. So you're really just operating on the part of the image that gives the gray blur. So I have a, a, the finished version here, and um, I'm gonna make two duplicate copies of it. Image, duplicate, and bring this silly thing over to, uh, over into the window where it shows. And we're gonna call this one LAB inversion. And we're gonna make another copy over here. If I ever get my mouse back. Where's my mouse? There it is. Image, duplicate, and thank you, it's in the right place. L channel inversion. 
and we'll make them both small. Again, please uh, keep in mind that this is a major topic and I'm really only giving the five cent version with a kind of formula for how to do it here. And, and there's a lot more that can be said, and I have said and will say. And also on the topic of the curve adjustment, that's also a very big topic. And if you, if you play with it and you end up getting frustrated, please bear in mind that there is another class. It's uh, on a Thursday, not a Tuesday, right, Phyllis? And Correct. Please send me questions, bring questions. I'm happy to try to do my best to help with specific examples. And uh, uh, let's, uh, okay, let's move ahead here. So this is, so one of the things you have to look at in LAB is what channel are you operating on? So with this lab inversion, I'm operating on all three channels. So I go image, adjustment, invert. Okay, and there I have, I've made my pretty red and white flowers basically blue, okay. Now, the rubber is gonna meet the road on the L channel inversion, which just reverses black and white information, white for black and black for white. So, um, I have, selected the lightness channel and the channels palette on this one. And I've got all channels eyeballed, so you can see all channels. I go image, adjustment, invert, okay? That actually is closer to what we want, but still not quite there. So, how do we get a little closer to there? Well, the first thing we do is we go, we duplicate our layer and we add a curve adjustment to the duplicate layer. So I'm gonna call it curve like that. I go image, adjustment curves. And what I'm really gonna do here is pull up the white stuff. Like crazy, more than, more than you really want. You wanna be able to get it all up and out. Okay, now I'm gonna put a hide all layer mask onto my adjustment. Layer, layer mask, hide all. And I'm going to take a nice floppy brush, um, maybe at about 300 pixels. I'm going to paint in those flowers. I want to leave the background alone. And what I do is I selectively paint in the areas I want to paint. The red flowers aren't bad, so I'm not going to paint them in at a high opacity. So I'm If you're not careful, you can over paint this stuff. Now, this is kind of a funky nighttime version of the flowers. Let's say that I want to uh, make them nicer. So the first thing I'm going to do is I will save this version here. So I go save as, and I'm it's already called L channel inversion, which works fine for me. Now remember that I said that you, um, you cannot, or you can, but it's not a good idea, uh, move between color spaces with a layered document. Now I need to move this back into RGB color because I need my full palette of blending modes which I don't have here in the LAB color space. LAB, if you look at the blending modes that are available, you'll see that many of them are grayed out. Okay, in particular, difference, exclusion, subtract, and divide, which are the kind of uh, what I've called sometimes the uh, weird blending modes or the psychedelic ones. We're, we're gonna need exclusion for this process. 
So what I do is I have to merge this layer down, layer, Latin image, and then I take it back into RGB, mode RGB. And now with this image in RGB, what I do is I copy the LAB inversion over it oh, in perfect alignment, famous last words, yep, in perfect alignment. And I go up to the blending modes and I pick exclusion, okay? And what that does is it gives me a sort of white fluffy softness on the petals of the poppies that were just too dark. So we're gonna put a hide all layer mask, layer mask, Latin image. Oop, I didn't mean to do that. I take it back. Good thing there's a history palette. Layer mask, hide all. And with a brush tool, well, 42 is a nice percentage. Let's turn it down. Getting rid of the little of the over yellow here. Maybe painted a little more strongly so it really is obvious. That's a very nice translucency on black that I'm now painting in. Just to, just to sort of make the point here, first of all, let's save this. Then I can go layer down, flatten image, save as, call it version A, and I can duplicate my image, layer, duplicate image. I can put the duplicate into screen blending mode like that. I can put a layer mask on top, hide all, and I can add a little bit more. So this is the um, high level view of the process that I call my twofer of getting an image on black out of an image that's on white, it's quite easy to do really once you, once you get the hang of it. Um, we'll, we'll close off the blue one, who needs blue? And as you'll see in LAB, if you go and review the uh, webinar um, on it, I do have a Photoshop action I've wrote that you, written that you can download for free that makes this process a bit easier. So just to do it side by side, um, here's the black and white version. Here's the white version. Phyllis? Yes. I have uh, really uh, two major topics left to do, and I'm looking at the time myself. And I sort of think, instead of running through the, the two topics, which are filter effects and textures and backgrounds, we, I probably should hold those over for the next webinar since we have another one. That sounds like a good idea. I think I so. Why don't, why, don't, why don't we say that? Why don't we take questions if there are any? And Lynn says, so happy there will be replays for future reference. Yeah, I understand that. I mean, this, honestly, I, I, as a teacher, uh, I love to teach my techniques, but I'm a little dense, okay, in the sense that I don't mean I'm stupid. I mean that um, there's a lot packed in here. Um, honestly, there is. And one of the things about flower photography, this kind of flower photography, is it's a metaphor for life, really. Um, you can do, you can use these techniques on almost anything, not just on flowers on a light box. In point of fact, it works well for photography on a black background, which is one of the things I, I love to show. And then when you have it on a black background, when you use the LAB stuff, you can invert it and put it on a white background. But there's really no kind of photography that knowing these techniques can't enhance and can enhance one's ability to pre-visualize the right thing. And uh, Christine has a question. Go ahead. Uh, do you have recommendations for what flowers photograph best? Being in Montana, I'm still pretty limited, although I expect the variety soon increasing. I, well, um, beautiful flowers work best. 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that all flowers are beautiful. And, and what's the difference between a flower and a weed? Well, that's in the eye of the beholder. I love to photograph things people think of as weeds. Uh, to be a little more serious about it, uh, the flowers that work best specifically for the flowers for transparency technique have some natural translucency in their petals. For example, if you look at the image that's up under the question slide there, you'll see that the white tulips there are quite translucent uh, and the orange ones not so much. You want some kind of species that has some uh, bit of translucency, although since you're in on my secrets here and you saw the naughty bits, how much do you think that that uh, translucency there is real? Good question. And uh, Joe wants to know, can you use some other lens other than a Zeiss lens? Yeah, of course, any lens works. Uh, I, my, my recommendation is a prime, roughly normal focal length lens for this. Uh, Deborah from Palo Alto very kindly pointed out to me that she uses a zoom lens and uses a rubber band of some kind to keep it from creeping. So there, yeah, there's no special requirement for lenses here. I mean, people don't understand about lenses that actually they're a, a unique crystal. A lens is a photographer's paintbrush. So you are somewhat limited in your palette by the crystals that you're photographing through. So. A good crystal is nice because it does a nice quality with the light, but by no means essential. I wouldn't feel you need to wait for a different lens than the one you have to try this. It will work perfectly well with whatever lens you're normally using. And Joe asks, you lost me on the L channel inversion, not the actual inversion, but the moves afterwards. Maybe show what you were aiming at and then discuss how the various moves got you closer. Yeah, well, I, I'm going to also recommend watching the LAB recording that's up on YouTube. The, uh, the, the issue was that the L channel inversion worked fine, but when there's a lot of gray in the image, the, in parts of the image, inverting the L channel is going to keep the gray there because, you know, if you're 50% gray and you invert it, you're still 50% gray. So what the moves were supposed to do, and I made two different moves, were to lighten the areas that were too dark. So when you go back and look through the recording of this webinar, you'll see that that happened in two ways. One is that the LAB inversion itself created a nice sort of soft, fluffy feeling when combined with the original inversion in the exclusion blending mode. The other thing I did was I made a copy of that image and then I used the screen blending mode to lighten selective areas. Well, thanks for the good question. Um, Don wants to know, I recall you saying that you shoot on a ladder at some point. I recently purchased the large light box. Have you ever used a platypod on the shelf of a ladder? <laughs> I, I, I have not, though I've sure been tempted to try, try something like that at times. Uh, please, I, I certainly have photographed from a ladder. I've mounted my tripod on a ladder. Uh, please be careful of yourself and of your camera if you do that. I like to think that lightbox flower photography is one of the things we can do in life that is least likely to harm anybody, uh, which is one of the things I like about it. But do please be careful. Um, that, that would be a, a good idea. And uh, let's see here. I don't see any other questions at the moment. Um, I did make a new screen for how to submit your work, if you want me to put it up. Uh, please, go ahead. Okay, I'll share my screen. Oh, there we go. As you can see, I fixed the Tuesday while you were talking, Harold. It now says Thursday. I like your X there, Phyllis. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to submit your work for review to Instagram, uh, use these tags so that Harold will see it. And then, yes, the next uh, webinar is part five over to you. And it's on Thursday, May 21st at 10 a.m. And you can find all the webinars that Harold's giving with the direct Zoom registration links on his uh, website in the learning area 
under live webinars. Well, thank you very much, everybody. I really do appreciate your spending time with us. It, Phyllis, and, it, Phyllis and I have a lot of fun doing this, and uh, we certainly are learning things. All, everything I always wanted to know about giving Zoom webinars, but definitely didn't know I had to ask. Now I know I have to ask them. Uh, <laughs> speaking of asking, if you do have questions, I covered a lot of ground today. This is not necessarily easy stuff. I think it's fun stuff. But if you do have questions, don't hesitate. Either ask them next time or bring them up to me. I'll do my best to answer them. And uh, stay well, be healthy. Um, I'm, I'm very, very happy to have you all here. It's any, and uh, thanks very much. Bye now. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending Photographing Flowers for Transparency, Part 4, Advanced Topics in Post-Production. As you can see on the screen, there are many ways to stay in touch with what Harold is doing. I think that's it for today. This is Phyllis Davis asking you to stay well, stay safe, stay mighty, and be creative. enjoyed this video and found it informative. Be creative and stay mighty.